Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, happy Sabbath to those that it is Sabbath and to those that it's not Sabbath yet. I know you, I wish you all a happy Sabbath. So we're going to continue the study on the third angel's message um, of A.T. Jones, number 20, and our study is the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. The basic premise that we're operating on is that um, the first, second, and third angels' messages are needed. So we're going to have a prayer, and then we're going to have a little bit of a discussion before we um, read from A.T. Jones. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath that's coming or that's here, and the time that we have to open up your word together. We invite your spirit's presence to direct and guide us in our study. And we are thankful, Lord, for the people who are searching for truth. We're grateful that uh, so many people are interested in this message and that this message is growing. And we pray, Lord, that we can represent you in those that we have contact with. You know, Lord, that you have a plan, and we just ask that um, we can submit our lives to you that we can allow you to work out your purposes in our lives. Now be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> um, when, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background story here. So when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I knew about Seventh-day Adventists. And in 19, I guess it would be, 1980, because I got baptized in 82. So it would have been in 1982. In the summer of 1982, I met a guy uh, named Norman Byers. He was a Seventh-day Adventist, and he was a new Seventh-day Adventist. He was actually a part of a group that he knew some of the people that I knew uh, before they were Adventists, so some of my brother's friends, and he, was, uh, he knew some of them, like people like Kelly Ross. And um, uh, Norman Byers is really the one who brought me into the Adventist church. So uh, I knew about Adventists. I was already keeping the Sabbath. Um, but I wasn't really interested in the Adventist church so much. Uh, I believe the state of the dead. And I met Norman Byers, and um, he worked at a health food store. And we became friends, and we normally argue about religion. Um, so... Uh, he invited me, though, to go to church. So the first time I went to church, Adventist church, is I think it was the first weekend in December in 1982. And um, so that uh, weekend, that Sabbath, uh, it would have been uh, December, uh, either December 2nd or December 9th. I'm not sure which one it was. But I know I didn't go to church again until... Uh, you know, so it'd be December 11th, pardon me. So let me see, I'm getting this wrong here. Let me get these dates right. Okay. So December 25th was when I was baptized. That was the Sabbath. And then it would have been, yeah, December 4th. I'm pretty sure it was December 4th. It was the first time I went to church. Might have been December 11th, but uh, 1982. But I didn't go to church again until I was baptized on December 25th. So I knew I, it was... Um, a couple of Sabbaths in a row that I missed, I believe. So I believe I didn't go on the 11th and the 18th, and then I went the 25th. And my wife and I, at the time, we got both got baptized. She was pregnant with my second son, Joseph. Uh, she was uh, 18 years old. I was 19. So that so was a long time ago. But anyway, Norman Byers... Um, it lives in, he went to Uchi Pines, and he lives in uh, Georgia, I believe, or Alabama. I'm not sure, certain, but I'm friends with him on Facebook. And he he had a, a clip, so I'm just going to show you this clip. So this is going to play over and over again. This is important, and unless we grasp it and believe it, it will pass by us and we'll be left 
to defend our own selves against the, uh, the devil and his temptations only to fail over and over and over again and be brought into slavery deeper and deeper and having regret and just wishing that something would change. Every opportunity that I had, I had to share this because I know that this is what we're missing in our church. Righteousness by faith, justific justification by faith, the third angel. Okay, so that's Norman Byers. That's him presenting uh, this message. And uh, we had a discussion. So I'm going to just bring it up here. So here's what I said. I don't know how to make this sidebar bigger, but you might not be able to see this. Okay, so it says, so I say, uh, without the first and second angel's messages, there's no way we can grasp the third, the third angel's message. The proclamation of the first and second angel's messages has been located by the word of inspiration. We're familiar with that quote in the spirit of prophecy, right? Um, that these messages need to be repeated. There cannot be a third without the first and second, right? So he doesn't really seem to have read of the quote. He says, amen, right? Because Often when you're talking with people and you give a spirit of prophecy quote, even if they don't agree with it, they will say they do. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but they, they will always say they agree with the quote. They'll always say amen, even if the quote doesn't say what they're saying or doesn't support what they're saying. But anyway, without an understanding and and experience in the message of the third angel, the first two messages will be powerless to transform the character of the person studying these messages, is what he says. Now, of course, that's not what the quote says, right? The quote doesn't say, without an understanding and experience of the message of the third angel, the first two angels' messages will be powerless. To get that from this quote is, to me, kind of remarkable, but he, he seems to miss the point of the quote because he's just reading into it what he already thinks. So I say, I do not get how you draw this conclusion. The first and second angel's messages are part of the three-step testing prophetic message. The third angel's message cannot be experienced without the experience of the first and second angel's messages. So he says, well, the first and second angel's messages are powerless we have to have the experience of the third angel. But the reality is... But I had the first and second first. Right, you have to, you have to put them in order, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. It talks about giving the main angels' messages in their order, right? So you, you can't put the cart before the horse. Um, so I say uh, the third angel's message cannot be experienced without the experience of the first and second angel's messages, which is what Ellen White is saying. I said, I preached the third angel for over 30 years without understanding the first and second angels messages. The third angels message without this was powerless. And then he replies, this might help you understand what I'm saying. So he's not trying to understand what I'm saying. He just wants me to understand what he's saying. Um, and then he's going to give this quote, which is well known quote in the spirit of prophecy. Several, several have written to me inquiring the message of justification, if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message, and I've answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. So he then says, there is no need to understand the first two angels' messages to understand righteousness by faith. Now, that might be true, that a person could understand righteousness by faith, but they can't experience righteousness by faith unless they experience the first two messages, right? That was my experience. I knew righteousness by faith. I knew Jones and Wagner, I mean, very well. But what, what is it that we lack when we don't have the experience of the first and second angels' messages? that is needed to experience the third angel's message. No fear God, give glory to him, our judge will come, worship him. Okay, but that wasn't the question. Oh, okay. so, so the question is, 
what is it that we need to experience in the first and second angel's messages so that we can experience the third? Why, why does Ellen White say we need the first and the second? What, what is that experience that, that is needed so that we can experience the third angel's message? What, what is in that? Because without the first two messages, there's something that the third message would lack. And what is that? Well, the first two messages gives us the experience. But, but the experience of what? Um, well, understanding. Uh, uh, of what? <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying okay, to think, put it. Okay, think about what the first two messages are. The first one is a prophetic message about a time prophecy that's coming, right? Yeah. Okay. The second message is Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Come out of her, my people. Now, so imagine if somebody says, well, I just need the third angel's message. So if they haven't come out of Babylon, can they comprehend the third angel's message? Uh, no. no. And if they don't understand the prophetic message, do they have the necessary faith because faith can't just be manufactured, right? Faith, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? So we experience, it, when we look at prophecy, we look at, at the prophecies of scripture, and we see that they are fulfilled, it increases our faith and our ability to then trust in God. So, so we know the third angel's message experience is that we have no confidence in self, and a complete trust in God, right? Now, there's another part in what he says in, in, his, in his message, which I don't know if you picked up on it. But often what people will talk about when they talk about righteousness by faith is that there's some kind of experience that we have to have. And, and usually that experience is some kind of victory in their lives over sin and that they will often claim to have it not in an explicit way like i haven't sinned since march you know type of thing sometimes it's that way sometimes they'll say satan doesn't tempt me anymore or i have this victory i have this wonderful experience of of overcoming sin in my life right now the thing is the focus in that understanding of righteousness by faith is upon ourselves. So the focus becomes my experience. But if you look at the first, second, and third angels messages as prophetic messages, what is the focus on? It would be prophecy, wouldn't it? It'd be on prophecy upon the event of prophecy being fulfilled before your eyes. And so the focus comes off of ourselves. It's not on, am I experiencing the third angel's message? You know, am I, am I righteous yet? Right? The focus is upon something that's going to instill faith in us and confidence in what is happening around us. So when the focus is just upon, um, somehow having an experience of righteousness by faith that is overcoming sin, the focus is not on the right thing. And it's very deceptive because I've seen it. What, what he expresses here in this video, I've seen before. And it doesn't turn out good for the individuals who have that perspective, right? Now, I'm not saying what's going to happen to him, and, and he may not fully even realize what he's saying, and it may not be what, what his experience is. But when he says there is no need to understand the first two angels' messages to understand righteousness by faith, he's showing he doesn't understand righteousness by faith at all. Correct? Yeah, I would say so. 
And he says, but you can't properly understand the significance of the first two angels unless you understand and experience righteousness by faith. And I don't think that that's the case. Well, or I think that you are experiencing righteousness by faith with the third, first two angels. But you can't separate the first two angels' messages from righteousness by faith because they are part of it. So when Ellen White says the righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity, she's not saying that the righteousness by faith um, is, is the only part of the message that, or, or that the third angel's message is the only one that is righteousness by faith. It's just that when we get to, right, when we get to the third angel, we are going to demonstrate to the world the righteousness by faith that we have um, developed and experienced as we've passed through each of the angels' messages, correct? Correct. Yeah. So, Makes so, my, sense. so my friend Norm Byers, he's the one who introduced, because some people came on, he's the one who actually invited me to church for the first time. That was, I believe, December 4th. 1982 and i was baptized three weeks later the, the next time i went to church and and he's lives down in georgia alabama i know he went to uchi pines uh, at that time when i first knew him he moved down there uh, originally was from montreal canada and uh from quebec and i believe if i remember correctly and but anyway he uh um he did this presentation and this is just out of context, but then I had a discussion with him. And so in this discussion, I, I give the quote that we, that you can't have the third without the first and second. But he's taking this statement that the third angel's message is righteousness by, is um, that righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity as not, um, as just stating that third angel's message equals righteousness by faith which is not what ellen white is saying when she says in verity she means in actuality in ex in experience so once we get to the third angel we've had the first and second angel which are also righteousness by faith you can't say the first angel's message has nothing to do with righteousness by faith right we, we look at sin righteousness and judgment as also those three steps there's many other three steps. So you can't just get to the experience of righteousness by faith without an understanding of the prophetic message and without coming out of Babylon. Those two things have to be experienced. Now, people can understand the theory of righteousness by faith, but not experience it. And they can understand the theory and imagine they have experienced it. Because we are subjective creatures. We can, we can imagine all kinds of things that were better than we are. Um, but when we go through the experience of the first, second, and third, we have the prophetic message that, one is it gives us faith in God's word. The second thing that it does is it shows us where we are in history. It gives us light for our feet. The second angel's message divorce us from the false teachings of Protestantism and Catholicism, these false ideas. And, and then the third angel, it's, it's addressing the issues of the Sabbath Sunday, where we now have to exercise that faith under the most trying circumstances. So they're all part of righteousness by faith. Um, so he says here, um, once that's understood that, you know, we understand righteousness by faith and then we can understand the first and second angels messages. He says, once that's understood and people are partakers of the divine nature, and then he puts in brackets, experience it. So, um, so he's, he's, I don't think if I would, I would quite put partakers of the divine nature, I wouldn't put experience it. Because this becomes a very subjective idea, but you know maybe he could explain it in some other way. Right? He's not writing a theological treatise; he's just commenting on Facebook. Then their understanding is opened. 
you should know this, he says to me. Um, and then uh, he quotes another Ellen White quote, December 23, 1890. Um, if through the grace of Christ, his people will become new bottles, he will fill them with the new wine. God will give additional light and old truths will be recovered. So this is correct, right? We get a recovery of old truths and, and replaced in the framework of truth. And wherever the laborers go, they will triumph as Christ ambassadors. They are to search the scriptures to seek for the truths that have been hidden beneath the rubbish of error. And every ray of light received is to be communicated to others. One interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up every other. Christ our righteousness. Now, this is true, right? So we know that as we progress in the Christian life, um, as we experience righteousness by faith, which is not just the third angel's message, right? Righteousness by faith is right from the beginning because we've, we've shown that uh, right from the beginning of our experience. But that experience on a line represents a three-step testing prophetic message. And it's true that one subject will swallow up every other, Christ our righteousness. That is true. But it doesn't mean that you, it's only when you understand the third angel's message that you then can understand the first and second. So he says, notice the declaration and everywhere the laborers go, they will triumph. This has been my experience. But prior to that, I was just repeating dry knowledge that did nothing from the heaters Nothing for the heaters, I think he means the hearers, except confirm them in the sleep. No more, it's time to wake up and repent, then the Lord will use us. Now this I find, from my experience, to be dangerous language. Because when a person says that this has been my experience, has it, right? Because I've seen people in this make these same types of statements and quickly fall away from the truth. Now, not always, so I've seen some stay in the church forever. But when we look at, at how God has been leading this movement, we can see that one of the things that Jeff has avoided was this message that Norman here is presenting um, because he saw the fruit of it. And the fruit of it tends to be self-righteousness. That is, there are always people claiming that they're presenting righteousness by faith and that they've experienced this thing and that we need to experience it too. But they don't give us the means by which it can be experienced. That is, they say they, they don't emphasize the first and second angels' messages. And Ellen White says they need to be repeated. You need to know the first and second angels' message in order to comprehend the third. Her statement to me is very, um, you know, it's unequivocal. So, um, so I say you're misreading the quote, especially regarding uh, the righteousness by faith is the third angels' message in verity. She is referring to the end of the process of the experience, both the first and second angels' messages are also righteousness by faith in that they represent justification and sanctification. However, the third angel's message is the finished work of Christ's character in his people. Without the first two messages, we cannot experience righteousness by faith in its completeness. When we understand the first and second angel's messages, we will be revitalized. That is my experience for all the, of those around me who are hearing these messages for the first time. Now notice my experience here is not the subjective experience of what I feel, because that, that's very subjective. But I look around at the fruit of the work of the message in those around me. Plus, I also have the statements in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. Um, and then I ask him a question. Let me, let me ask you a question. Do you know what the first and second angels' messages are and when they were given. So he hasn't responded to that question. I asked it 22 hours ago. So you gotta give him some time. He may be busy in Sabbath preparation. Um, but you can see, this is where we are in studying this message, right? So we're reading A.T. Jones, these 
things that I read uh, in my early 20s, right? So read these things, studied uh, A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagner, all their materials that I could get back in uh, the 1980s and um, into the 90s. And, I, and that's the message I preached, Jones and Wagner's messages, for years and years until I came in contact with this message. And then I realized what I had been missing. So, so we're going to read some Jones now, but I just wanted to put that in context for people. And I thought that that discussion was interesting. Hopefully people found that that was uh, interesting, the discussion I had with Norman Byers. And I'm going to send him this video and ask him to watch it and um, see what he says about it. Well, that's a, that's pretty much a mindset for most Adventists, right? Well, for conservative Adventists who focus on righteousness by faith. But the problem with, with looking for an experience is that it becomes subjective, right? So what, what I have done in my Christian walk is taken the focus off myself from other than to see myself as a sinner. So I know that I'm a sinner. If I look at myself, I don't expect to see righteousness. Righteousness is in Christ. And I do the work that he asked me to do. That is, I just try to obey his voice and listen to his voice. I know that his will is contrary to my will. And that um, when he asks me to do something, it doesn't matter how I feel about it. I need to do it. And that I need to accept his word. And that I need to study and understand prophecy. I need to understand his word. And that increases my faith and confidence in him. And, and that's what I'm going to need when these trials come upon us. I'm not going to need faith and confidence in myself. Right? I just need faith and confidence. Well, we're, yeah, we're an empty vessel. So. <laughs> so, you know, Christ is going to work out his righteousness in me. In that, I have confidence. I don't need to see it in order to believe it. I'm just going to trust that, that he's going to do this in me as I cooperate with him. So, so this is what Jones has been explaining, though the, the only problem that we have with Jones here is that because he doesn't understand the present situation, that is, he didn't know what was going to happen to his message in the 1990s and how the church was going to change and how everything was going to be redefined so that when people read A.T. Jones, they often read into it what they have already been taught, and, and he, he, he hasn't written it in a way to speak to their mind. He's writing it to speak to people in his time. So, so there is a difference between what has happened with the language, that is, the terminology of Scripture has been distorted within Adventism. And I saw this unfold through the 1990s uh, with the nature of Christ. So that you could have people read A.T. Jones and actually completely understand what he's saying about the nature of Christ, even though he's very clear. It's just those words have been redefined. And so when they read something, it means something different than what Jones would mean. And, and I saw that change happen. So, so I was witness to this definitional shift of theological terminology that uh, happened in Adventism, within conservative Adventism. Okay, so we're going to start reading Jones here. Um, in John 17, verse 4, the first clause, um, okay, the question here, so there's a question, did A.T. Jones have experience in the first and second angels' messages? No. This is one of the reasons why I believe that the message of Jones and Wagner failed, because the first and second angels' messages had been rejected by Adventists, correct? Well, yeah, we could see that. Yeah. Clearly see that. Right. So they had been rejected. Jones, he, he, he knows about the first and second angels' messages. And he might not realize that he has rejected them. 
But because the messages weren't advancing and growing, that is, they weren't really being studied, not just by Jones, but by everyone, uh, the church was moving towards more a Protestant understanding of things. And um, we just had this superficial understanding of Millerite history. And so Jones, he didn't experience them. He wasn't a part of that experience. Ellen White talks about those who had not experienced those messages. And when she talks about those messages being repeated, she's not just she's not just saying that, you know, we need to talk about we need to republish them in some books. She's actually talking about an experience that's going to happen. And we believe that this movement is experiencing those messages at the present time. Okay, so that, that's a very good question. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. In John 17, 4, the first clause of the verse is the words of Christ in the prayer for us all. I have glorified thee on the earth. In the previous lesson, we were brought to consider the purpose of God concerning man, even his eternal purpose, um, and that that purpose is fulfilled before the whole universe in Jesus Christ in human flesh. The purpose of man's existence is to glorify God, and this has been shown before the universe in Jesus Christ. For God's eternal purpose concerning man was purposed in Christ and carried out in Christ for every man since man sinned. And he says, I have glorified thee on the earth. This shows that the purpose of God in man's creation is that man shall glorify him. And what we shall study this evening is how we should glorify God. How is glorified God, how God is glorified in man and what it is to glorify God. So how we glorify God, how God is glorified in man, and what it is to glorify God. So these three things. When we study Christ, and we see what he did, and what God did in him, we shall know what it is to glorify God. So, so he says that's one of the things that we're going to study. And he says that we, when we study Christ and see what he did and what God did in him, we shall know what it is to glorify God, right? So Christ is the example of what it means to glorify God. He is the model. Now, did Christ trust in his own righteousness? Did he see himself as righteous, as perfect? Did he see righteousness as emanating from himself? He says, the works you see me do, they come from the Father. Of my own self, I can do nothing. Now, it wasn't true that Christ of his own self could do nothing. But he could not do, if he, if he did something of his own self, he would not be our savior. If he utilized his, his own nature to overcome sin. Right? If he used his own power to overcome sin. So Jones has made that clear. And in him we find what is the purpose of our creation and what is the purpose of our existence. And in fact, what is the purpose of the creation and the existence of every intelligent creature in the universe. We have seen in preceding lessons that God alone was manifested in Christ in the world. Christ himself was not manifested. He was kept back. He was emptied and became ourselves in the human, on the human side. And then God, God alone, was manifested in him then what is it to glorify God? It is to be in the place where God and God alone shall be manifested in the individual. And that is the purpose of the creation and the existence of every angel and of every man. To glorify God, it is necessary for each one to be in the condition and in the position in which none but God shall be manifested because that, is, that was the position of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he said, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. John 14, 10. I came not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me, John 6, 8, 6 38. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works, John 14, 10. 
I can of my own self do nothing, John 50, or 5, verse 30. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me, draw him, John 6, 44. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Now sayest then, thou then showest the Father, John 14, verse 9. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him, John 7, 18. Therefore he said, the words that I speak, I speak not of myself, because as in the other verse, he that speaks of himself, that is from himself, seeks his own glory. But Christ was not seeking his own glory. He was seeking the glory of him that sent him. Therefore he said, the words that I speak, I speak not of myself. In so doing, he sought the glory of him that sent him. And there stands the record that he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. In him. He was so entirely emptied of himself, so entirely was he free, um, uh, so was he from being manifested in any way, that no influence went forth from him except the influence of the Father. Now, this was so to such an extent that no man could come to him except the Father drew that man to him. That shows how completely he himself was kept in the background, how completely he was empty. He was done so thoroughly that no man could come to him, that no man could feel any influence from him or be drawn to him except from the Father himself. Manifestation of the Father that could draw any man to Christ. That simply illustrates the one grand fact that we are studying just now, what it is to glorify God. It is to be so entirely emptied of self that nothing but God shall be manifested no influence go forth from the individual but the influence of God, so emptied that everything, every word, all that is manifested, will be only of God and will tell only of the Father. I have glorified thee on the earth. When he was upon the earth, he was in our human sinful flesh, and when he emptied himself and kept himself back, the Father so dwelt in him and manifested himself there that all the works of the flesh were quenched, and the overshadowing glory of God, the character of God, the goodness of God, were manifested instead of anything of the human. This is the same as we had in a previous lesson, that God manifest in the flesh, God manifest in sinful flesh, is the mystery of God. It is not God manifested in sinless flesh, but in sinful flesh. That is to say, God will so dwell in our sinful flesh today that although that flesh be sinful, its sinfulness will not be felt or realized, nor cast any influence upon others that God will so dwell yet in sinful flesh, that in spite of all the sinfulness of sinful flesh, his influence, his glory, his righteousness, his character shall be manifested wherever that person goes. And this is precisely the case with Jesus in the flesh. And so God has demonstrated to us all how we should glorify God. Now, I want to make a point here, too, that Jones is doing. Now, now we, the question was asked, and I'm thinking about it as I'm reading here. Now, did Jones understand the first and second angel's message? Right? He, he understood them, and he understood righteousness by faith. But the experience is the thing that we have to go through. We know that Jones didn't live in the time of the first and second angels' messages. He hadn't experienced them. He might have known about them. He might have even been able to know quite a bit more than most Adventists know. And he also understood the third angel's message. And one of the reasons I know that is that Jones never uses his, himself as the example of the successfulness of the third angel's message. Right? He points us to Christ as the example. Yeah, outside of ourselves. Right. If I say, I've experienced this, then I'm pointing to myself as the example, right? Yeah, that's kind of troubling. Right. And I've seen it happen so many times. And it, I, I have not seen it yet um, end well for those individuals. So I'm, I'm kind of concerned about Norman Byers in him saying that. Now, it may be 
you know, he's trying to urge upon people, you can have the same experience I have. But he's now holding himself up as the example. But we see Jones doesn't do that. He says, this was precisely the case with Jesus in the flesh. And so God has demonstrated to us all how we should glorify God. Jones hasn't demonstrated it. I haven't demonstrated it. It may be true that one day I will, but I will never point to myself as the example of that demonstration because I won't see it. I, I only know that by pointing to Christ that I can take people's eyes off themselves just as I need to take my eyes off of myself. He has demonstrated to the universe how the universe is to glorify God. That is, that God and God alone shall be manifested in every intelligence in the universe. That was the intent of God from the beginning, that his purpose, his eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. We might read it now. We shall have occasion to refer to it afterward. We will read the text that tells us, tells it all in a word. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. What is that? What is that will? What is that will which he has purposed in himself? He being the eternal God, purposing this purpose in himself, it being his own purpose. It is the same that is spoken of in another place as his eternal purpose. What is God's eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus? Here it is. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Look that over now and think that God might gather together in one all things in Christ. Who is the one in, into whom God gathers all things in Christ? That one is God. Who was in Christ? God was in Christ. Nobody was manifested there but God. God dwelt in Christ. Now in Christ, he is gathering together in one all things both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Therefore, his purpose in the dispensation of the fullness of times is to gather together in himself all things in Christ, through Christ, by Christ, and in Christ, all things in heaven and earth are gathered together in the one God, so that God alone will be manifested throughout the whole universe. That when the dispensation of times is completed, and God's eternal purpose stands before the universe completed, Wherever you look, upon whomsoever you look, you will see God reflected. You will see the image of God reflected, and God will be all in all. That is what we see in Jesus Christ. So if we think about this, um, often in our Christian experience, we're looking to overcome sin, right? Now, sin is a symptom of a much more serious condition. Correct? Yes. Okay. Now, we sometimes try to fool ourselves about our uh, sinful condition by modifying our behavior, right? So if I can stop doing certain things, then there probably isn't anything wrong with me, right? And this is how modern medicine works. Somebody has an illness, they got a fever, well, let's get rid of the fever. So, you know, you can get rid of the fever, give them an aspirin or something. And so the person then, well, I'm fine now. But there is actually an underlying condition which may be causing that fever. We have symptoms. Symptoms tell you that there's something wrong. Um, you have a pain in your leg and you take a painkiller. It doesn't get rid of the problem that caused the pain. You just don't feel the pain anymore. And so this is how we often approach salvation. We know that we're sinners. We see our behavior. We see that that's a problem. And so we figure out ways to modify our behavior. And some people are good at modifying their behavior. Some people are better than others at it, maybe. Um, and some people are even better at fooling themselves about modifying their behavior. That is, 
they maybe pick and choose which parts of their behavior they want to modify. And uh, the things uh, that they can modify then become the important things to them. The things they can't modify, uh, they try not to have a conviction about those things. But the purpose here is not to just stop sinning, right? God's eternal purpose has to do with a unity with Christ, that Christ is manifest in human flesh, right? As Jeff put here, a root cause, right? Now, the problem is we're separated from God. Now, our sinful nature is, is something that brings us guilt and condemnation, and it makes it difficult for God to come close to us. But without the promise of Christ, without him uh, promising to overcome sin, without him coming in our sinful nature, we would have no hope. And so we know that part of that purpose includes the work and the plan of salvation in changing our hearts, giving us a new heart. But the purpose is not just to stop us from sinning. The purpose is something that goes beyond what any human thought can conceive of because we don't even fully understand the righteousness of God. God wants to do something with us that is showing his glory. And the fact that I'm a sinner is, is just a fact. I'm a sinner even if I give my heart to Christ now, and he forgives me my, for my past sins, I don't cease to be a sinner in the sense that if you look at my whole life, if you just measure that whole life, you can say, well, this person has sinned. Now, God may have forgiven me, but if I somehow think that just because he's forgiven me, I'm no longer a sinner, then I've, I've sort of missed the point of his forgiveness. Because he doesn't change my nature. He doesn't change what I am. He, he gives me something else, which is his nature. He gives me his mind. And that is something that I, I don't have in myself. I only have it in him. So, um, so when you read this long sentence, through Christ, by Christ, and in Christ, all things in heaven and on earth are gathered together in the one God, so that God alone will be manifested through the whole universe, that when the dispensation of times is completed, and God's eternal purpose stands before the universe completed, wherever you look, upon whomsoever you look, you will see God reflected. You will see the image of God reflected, and God will be all in all. That is what we see in Jesus Christ. So we can see what that is about. That this isn't about me just getting my sins forgiven so that I can somehow be see myself as good. This is about God taking all of creation and transforming it into his image. And he does that through Christ. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Not in our face, in the face of Jesus Christ. Now it shines in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of the God in the face of Jesus Christ. Not in my face, right? You understand what I'm saying? This is not me being glorified so that that I'm glorifying myself or that God is even glorifying me in the sense of I'm good. But we are glorified only in that the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ is seen in us. We look into the face of Jesus Christ. What do we see? We see God. We see the Father. We do not see Christ reflected in the face of Jesus Christ. Do you understand what Jones is saying here? Jones is reflecting the Father, or Jones. Christ is reflecting the Father, and Jones is quite clear that Christ, as our example, is not reflecting himself. He emptied himself that God might be reflected, that God might shine forth to man who could not bear his presence in human flesh. When we present righteousness by faith, 
what we are presenting is not our experience as an example of what it means to have righteousness by faith. What we are presenting is a message to bring a conviction to a person that they're not going to look for righteousness in themselves, but instead they're going to begin to look for righteousness in Christ. They need to see Christ, Christ's righteousness. Now, it is true that Christ's righteousness can be seen in us. We're not going to see it in us, though, are we? No. No. Because that's not where we look for Christ's righteousness. Where do we look for Christ's righteousness? Christ. In, in Christ, right? Yeah. Now, it, it, Christ could shine forth his father's righteousness. So people saw their father's righteousness, the father's glory in Jesus Christ. And it's true that people could see Christ's glory in me if I'm reflecting Christ's glory. But they're going to see Christ's glory, right? They're going to be drawn to Christ, not to me. And I'm not going to see Christ's glory in me because I'm not looking to me. I'm looking to Christ. Jesus Christ took man's flesh, which as a veil, so modified the bright green beams of the glory of God that we might look and live. We cannot look upon the unveiled face of God, not as much as the children of Israel might look upon the face of Moses. Therefore, Jesus gathers in himself man's flesh and veils the bright consuming glory of the Father, so that we, looking into his face, can see God reflected and can see and love him as he is and thus have the life that is in him. This thought is noticed in 2 Corinthians 3.18. Um, I will merely touch the verse for the present. We have occasion to refer to it again before we are through with the lesson. So we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Where do we behold the glory of the Lord? In the face of Jesus Christ. But he says, we behold it as in a mirror. What is a mirror for? A mirror gives no light of its own. A mirror reflects the light that shines upon it. We all, with open face, behold in the face of Jesus Christ, in the face of Jesus Christ as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. Therefore, Christ is the one through whom the Father has reflected, is reflected to the whole universe. Now, um, we've done studies on this, on 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we've compared it to uh, the book of James, where he talks about looking into the law, the perfect law of liberty. It looks like a man looking into a glass, and he sees what manner of man he is, right? But then he forgetteth, right? So uh, James and Paul are talking about the same thing, usually from a bit different perspective. But... Um, if you read that whole chapter, which is all about giving the law and the glory of Moses um, that shine on Moses' face and so forth, what Paul is illustrating here is that when you see Christ, you see the glory of God, and the glory of God is going to expose who you are, right? So you're not going to see yourself as righteous. You're going to see Christ as righteous. That is what this movement has talked about as far as uh, the Mara vision, right? That's, that's the looking glass vision. That's where, like, Isaiah or Job or Daniel or John, you behold Christ, and in beholding Christ, you see um, how unlike Christ you are. And, and the message of righteousness by faith will always be a message that points us to Christ and shows us how unchrist like we are. It will never show us that how victorious we are. That's not the purpose of the gospel, because any victory we have is completely in Christ anyway. It's Christ in us, doing in us. It's his glory, not our own. He alone could reflect the Father in his fullness because his goings forth have been from the days of eternity. 
And as it says in the eighth of Proverbs, I was with him as one brought up with him. He was one of God, equal with God, and his nature is the nature of God. Therefore, one grand necessity that he alone should come to the world um, and save man was because the Father wanted to manifest himself fully in the sons of men, and none of the universe could manifest the Father in his fullness except the only begotten Son, who is the image of the Father. No creature could do it because he is not great enough. Only he whose goings forth have been from the days of eternity could do it. Consequently, he came and God dwelt with him. How much? All the fullness of the Godhead bodily is reflected in him. And this is not only to men on the earth, but it is that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one, in Christ, all things which are in heaven and which are on earth. In Christ, God is manifested to the angels and reflected to men in the world in a way in which they cannot see God otherwise. So then, we have so much as to what it means to glorify God and as how it is done. It is to be so emptied of self that God alone shall be manifested in his righteousness, his character, which is his glory. In Christ is shown the Father's purpose concerning us. All that was done in Christ was to show what will be done in us, for he was ourselves. Therefore, it is for us constantly to have before our minds the one great thought that we are to glorify God upon the earth. In him, and by him, we find that divine mind which in Christ emptied his righteous self. By this divine mind, our righteousness is emptied in order that God may be glorified in us, and it may be true of us, I have glorified thee on the earth. Let us read these, those two verses in Corinthians now for our own sakes. A while ago, we read them as from this, his side, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shine in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Look at ourselves now. What first has God done? Shined, um, let us look ourselves now, not look at ourselves. Let us let look at our, well, look at ourselves now. Maybe that is what he's saying. I'm not sure what he means by that. Anyway, um, anyway, what first has God done? God done? Shined into our hearts. What for? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Don't you see then that God in Jesus Christ is manifesting, showing forth from the face of Christ, his glory, which reflected in us shines also to others. Therefore, ye are the light of the world. We are the light of the world because the light of the glory of God shining forth from Jesus Christ into our hearts is reflected, shines forth to others. The people seeing us, seeing our good works, may glorify God in the day of visitation. They glorify the Father, which is in heaven. Study the process. There is the Father, dwelling in light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen, nor can see, of such transcendent glory, of such all-consuming brightness of holiness, that no man could look upon him and live. But the Father wants us to look upon him and live. Therefore, the only begotten of the Father yielded himself freely as the gift and became ourselves in human flesh that the Father in him might so veil his consuming glory and the rays of his brightness that we might look and live. And when we look there and live, that bright shining glory from the face of Jesus Christ shines into our hearts and is reflected to the world. Right? So you can see how this is not about us, our righteousness. This is about Christ's righteousness, which is the glory of the Father. Now, the last verse of the third chapter, again, we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, right? Now, I just want to look here quickly at what James says, because I referred to that. And... Um,
So this is in James chapter one. Um, and he goes on to, he's talking about the doers of the word and not hearers only. For if any be a hearer, this is verse 23, of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror, right? For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed, right? So James and Paul are saying the same thing. James is focusing upon um, the idea that we, when we look in this mirror, we see our true condition. We both behold ourselves, right? But this is, and, and, and if we look in a regular mirror, right, we just see ourselves. But when we look at the law of liberty, when we see the image when this glass that we're looking in is the glory of the Lord, um, we are changed, right? So they both have this idea that we are changed. So we are changed into the same image. Uh, the image of whom? The image of Jesus Christ. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Jesus Christ reflected the image of God. We, changed into the same image, shall reflect the image of God. Now, this is where um, uh, the church doesn't like this idea, right? The idea that we're going to be changed into the image of God, that we're going to reflect God's character, they think is some kind of error, last generation theology. Um, but this is the whole purpose of the Bible. This is God's purpose, his eternal purpose. Now, for many people, it's just going to be, well, when Jesus comes back, uh, then his eternal purpose could be just fulfilled, right? He'll just, he'll give us new natures and then we can reflect his character. But if that was the case, what, what's the delay? Why couldn't God just give us new bodies now, everyone? Give us sinless natures so that we can reflect the image of Christ. What would be the problem with that? Could he do that? Would we reflect the image of Christ if he just ended this world right now and just gave us all new bodies, sinless bodies? Well, I don't think we reflect the image of Christ if he did that. No, because a character change has to occur, right? Yeah. Without the mind of Christ, getting a new body isn't going to solve the problem, right? We have to have the mind of Christ. That is, Christ's character has to be perfectly reproduced in his people before he can come to claim them as his own. So God is the one who can, can understand what each of us needs in order for that, uh, for us to not trust in self and to trust in him. So we need people that are going to have the mind of Christ and reflect the image of God while they are still alive, just as Christ did. Not when we get some glorified body. Jones goes on, he says, the German gives another reading more emphatic even than ours here. I will read it in English. But now is reflected in us all the glory of the Lord. Do you see it? Now in us all is reflected. But in us all is reflected the glory of the Lord. In us all the glory of the Lord. Um, in us all is reflected the glory of the Lord. The idea in our English version and this I and the German are both correct. We see in the face of Christ the glory and are changed into the same image from glory to glory. And there is also reflected in us the glory of the Lord. Now we'll read the rest of the verse in the German. But now is reflected in us all the glory of the Lord with uncovered face. And we are glorified in the same image from one glory to another as from the Lord, who is this, who the Spirit is. The Lord who is the Spirit. The previous verse said, the Lord is that Spirit. So you see that the whole sense is that God shall be glorified in us, that we shall be glorified by that glory, and that this may be reflected to all men everywhere in order that they may believe and glorify God. Look now again in the 17th of John. He tells the same story there in John 17, 22. I will read again the fourth and fifth verses. 
I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Now the second, the 22nd verse, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. He has given it to us. Therefore, it belongs to us. This glory belongs to the believer in Jesus. And when we yield ourselves to him, he gives us that divine mind that empties ourselves. And then God in Jesus Christ shines into our hearts from which is reflected his own glory, his own divine image. And this will be so perfectly accomplished that when he comes in every believer upon whom he looks, he will see himself. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He sees himself reflected in his people so that all reflect the image and glory of God. Let us use natural things that we, that we may, if possible, see this a little clearer. Uh, there's the sun shining in the heavens. You and I would like to look upon the sun and see him as he is, but even a, a, even a glance so dazzles our eyes that it takes a moment for them to recover their natural strength. Thus, we cannot look upon the sun to behold the glories that are there. The sun has glories and beauties as he shines forth in the heavens. Now, if you take a prism, a three-sided, three-edged piece of glass, and hold it to the sun that the rays of the sun may shine through it, you will see reflected on the wall, upon the ground, or wherever it may be, that the reflection falls in such a reflection, you see the sun as he is in himself. But what do you see? What is it called? A rainbow. And what is more beautiful than a rainbow? You cannot have a more wonderful blending of colors than are in the rainbow. But that rainbow is simply the sun, with his glory so distributed that we can look upon it and see how beautiful he is. We look yonder. All this glory is there, but we cannot see it there. We cannot see it in the face of the sun. The sun is too bright. Our eyes are not accustomed to the light. We cannot take it in. Therefore, the prism takes that glory and causes it to shine forth in such rays that we can look upon it. And this enables us to see the sun as we could not otherwise. Yet when we look upon the rainbow, we are only looking at the sun. Looking at the rainbow, we see simply the glory that there is in the sun as he shines in the heavens. Looking through into the open face of the sun, we can see, cannot see him as he is. But looking at the reflection, we see the glory of the sun in a way that it delights us to look upon it. Now God is ever so much brighter than the sun. If the sun dazzles our eyes by a mere glance, what would the transcendent glory of the Lord do upon our mortal sinful eyes? It would consume us. Therefore, we cannot look upon him as he is in his unveiled, unmodified glory. Our nature is not such as to bear it, but he wants us to see his glory. He wants the whole universe to see his glory. Therefore, Jesus Christ puts himself here between the Father and us, and the Father causes all his glory to be manifested in him. And as it shines forth, forth from his face, the glory is so distributed, so modified, that we can look upon it, and it is made so beautiful that we delight in it. Thus we are enabled to see God as he is. In Jesus Christ we see nothing that is not of God in the full brightness of his unveiled glory. Now the sun shines in the natural heavens day by day, and all these glories he makes known to the sons of men and places before the children of men. All that the sun needs in order to keep his glories ever before us in that beautiful way is a prism, a medium through which to shine for the refraction of his glory, and something for these rays to fall upon for reflection after they have passed through the prism. Uh, you could have a rainbow every day of the year, in the year if you had a prism and something for the reflected rays to fall upon. So also, you can have the glory of God manifest in every day of the year if you will only hold Jesus Christ before your eyes as a blessed prism for refracting the bright beams of God's glory and your own self presented to God just as God would have you with these refracted rays to fall upon for reflection. Then not only you, but other people will constantly see the glory of God. All that God wants, all that he needs, in order that man shall see and know his glory is a prism through which to shine. In Jesus Christ, that is furnished in completeness. Next, he wants something upon which these refracted rays may fall and be reflected, that people can see it. 
Will you let yourself stand there, open to the refracted rays of the glory of God, as they shine through that blessed prism, which is Christ Jesus? Let those rays of the glory of God fall upon you, uh, that men looking there may see reflected the glory of God. That is what is wanted. Another thought, take your prism and hold it up to the sun. The refracted rays of light fall on the wall of the house and behold in the reflection, the beautiful rainbow. But that plastered wall is only mud. Can that mud manifest the glory of the sun? Can the sun be glorified by that mud? Yes, certainly. Can that mud reflect the bright rays of the sun so that it will be beautiful? How can mud do that? Oh, it is not in the mud. It is in the glory. You can hold the prism up to the sun and let the refracted rays fall upon the earth. And you can hold it there and that earth can manifest the glory of the sun. Not because the earth has any glory in itself, but because of the glory of the sun. Is it too much then for us to think that sinful flesh, such as we, worthless dust and ashes as we are, is it too much for us to think that such as we can manifest the glory of the Lord, which is refract, refracted through Jesus Christ, the glory of the Lord shining from the face of Jesus Christ? It may be that you are clay. It may be that you are the lowest of the earth. It may be that you are sinful as any man is. But simply put yourself there and let that glory shine upon you as God would have it. And then you will glorify God. Oh, how often the discouraged question is asked, how can such a person as I am glorify God? My dear brother or sister, it is not in you. It is in the glory. The virtue is not in you to make it shine any more than it is the mud in the mud to make the rainbow shine. It is our art to furnish a place for the glory to fall, that it may shine in the beautiful reflected rays of the glory of God. The virtue is not in us. It is in the glory. That is what it is to glorify God. It requires the emptying of self, that God in Christ may be glorified. The mind of Christ does that, and then God is glorified. Though we have been sinful all our lives, and our flesh is sinful flesh, God is glorified, not by merit that is in us, but by the merit that is in the glory. That is the purpose for which God has created every being in the universe. It is that every being shall be a means of reflecting and making known the brightness of the glory of the character of God as revealed in Jesus Christ. Way back yonder was one who was so bright and glorious by the glory of the Lord that he began to give himself credit for that. And he proposed to shine of himself. He proposed to glorify himself. He proposed to reflect light from himself, but he has not shined any since with any real light all has been darkness since and that is the origin of darkness in the universe and the results that have come from that from the beginning until the last result last result that shall ever come from it are simply the results of that one effort to manifest self to let self shine to glorify self and the end of that is that it all perishes and comes to naught to glorify self is to come to naught. It is to cease to be. The glory God, to glorify God is to continue eternally. And what makes people, what he makes people for is to glorify him. The one who glorifies him cannot help but exist to all eternity. God wants such beings as that in the universe. The question for every man is indeed, to be or not to be, that is the question. Shall we choose to be and to be a means of glorifying God to all eternity? Or shall we choose to glorify self for a little season and that only in darkness and then go out in everlasting darkness? Oh, in view of what God has done, it is not hard to decide which way to choose, is it? It is not hard to decide. Then shall it not, shall it not be our choice now and forever to choose only God's way? to choose to glorify him and him alone. Now, another word as to what that takes, uh, here is a passage in John 1 verse, or John 12, verse 23. Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. Now, is my soul troubled? And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. 
What then did he say? Father, glorify thy name. There he was, standing in the shadow of Gethsemane. He knew the hour was coming, and he knew what it meant. Here was this trouble pressing upon his divine soul and drawing from him. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this cause came I unto this hour. The only thing then there was to say, as he came to that hour, for that purpose, the only thing he could say was, Father, glorify thy name. After that came Gethsemane and the cross and death. But in this surrender, Father, glorify thy name, there was taken the step that gave him victory in Gethsemane and on the cross and over death. That there was his victory, and you and I shall come to that place many a time. We have been in that place already, where there comes a time when upon me there may be this demand made. That experience has to be passed through and looking at it as it stands and as we see it, we shall be tempted to say, oh, is it necessary that that shall be born? Is it not more than even God requires of man to bear? Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Who brought you to that hour? Who brought you face to face with that difficulty? How did you get there? The Father is dealing with us. He brought us there. Then when under his hand we are brought to the point at which it seems as though it would take the very soul out of a man to bear it, what shall we say? Father, save me from this hour? Why? For this cause I came to this hour. He brought me there for a purpose. I may not know what the experience is that he has for me beyond that. I may not know what is the divine purpose in that trial, but one thing I know. I have chosen to glorify God. I've chosen that God, instead of myself, shall be glorified in me, that his way shall be found in me instead of my way. Therefore, we cannot say, Father, save me from this hour. The only thing to do is to bow in submission. The only word to say is, Father, glorify thy name. Gethsemane may follow immediately. The cross will certainly follow. But it is victory in that Gethsemane. It is victory upon that cross and over all that may come. This is certainly true, for God does not leave us without the word. Read right now. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. That word is for you and for me in every trial because the glory which thou gavest I have given them. It belongs to us. He will see that it is reflected upon us and through us that men shall know that God is still manifested, manifest in the flesh. What then shall be our choice? Let it be settled once and forever. It is to be or not to be. Which shall we choose to be? But to, but to be means to glorify God. The sole purpose of existence in the universe is to glorify God. Therefore, the choice is to be the choice to glorify God and the choice to glorify God is the choice that self shall be emptied and lost and God alone shall appear and be seen. Then when all is done, the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians gives the grand consummation, 24 to the 28th verses. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith, all things are put under him. It is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. All in how many? He will be all in me. He will be all in you. He will be all in everybody through Jesus Christ. There we see the plan completed. It is that the whole universe and everything in it shall reflect God. That is the privilege that God has set before every human being. It is the privilege which he has set before every creature in the universe. Lucifer and multitudes of them who went with him refused it. Men refused it. What shall you and I do? Shall we accept the privilege? Let us see if we can get some idea of the measure of that privilege. What did it cost to bring that privilege to you and me? What did it cost? It cost the infinite price of the Son of God. Now question, 
Was this gift a gift of only 33 years? In other words, having consisted in eternity until he came to this world, did Jesus then come to this world as he did for only 33 years and then go back as he was before to consist in all respects as he was before throughout eternity to come? And thus his sacrifice be practically for only 33 years? Was this sacrifice a sacrifice of only 33 years? Or was it an eternal sacrifice? When Jesus Christ left heaven, he emptied himself and sank himself in us. For how long a time was it? And that is the question. The answer is that it was for all eternity. The Father gave up his Son to us, and Christ gave up himself to us for all eternity. Never again will he be in all respects as he was before. He gave his life to us. Now I do not undertake to define this. I shall simply read a word on this from the spirit of prophecy, that you may know that it is a fact and that you will know that we are on safe ground and then take it as a blessed truth and leave the explanation of it to God in eternity. Here's the word. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave him not only to live among men, to bear their sins and die their sacrifice. He gave him to the fallen race. Christ was to identify himself with the interests and needs of humanity. He who is one with God has linked himself with the children of men by ties that are never to be broken. When did he link himself with us? In our flesh, in our nature. To what extent did he link himself with us? By ties that are never to be broken. Thank the Lord. Then he sank the nature of God, which he had with God before the world was, and took our nature. And he bears our nature forevermore. That is the sacrifice that wins the hearts of men. Were it looked upon as many did look upon it, that the sacrifice of Christ was only for only 33 years, and then he died in the, on the death on the cross and went back into eternity in all respects as he was before, men might argue that in view of eternity before and eternity after, 33 years is not such an infinite sacrifice after all. But when we consider that he sank his nature in our human nature to all eternity, that is a sacrifice. That is the love of God, and no heart can reason against it. There is no heart in this world that can reason against that fact, whether the heart accepts it or not, whether the man believes it or not. There is a subduing power in it, and the heart must stand in silence in the presence of that awful fact. That is the sacrifice which he made, and I read on. He was one with God, has linked himself with the children of men by ties that are never to be broken. Jesus is not ashamed to call them brethren. Our sacrifice, our advocate, our brother, bearing our human form before the Father's throne and through eternal ages, one with the race he has redeemed, the Son of Man. And what, that is what it cost, the eternal sacrifice of one who, has one who was one with God. This is what it cost to bring to men the privilege, privilege to glorify God. Now, another question, was the privilege there worth the sacrifice or was the price paid to create the privilege? Please think carefully. What is the privilege? We have found that the privilege brought to every soul is to glorify God. And what did it cost to bring that privilege to us? It cost the infinite sacrifice of the Son of God. Now, did he make the sacrifice to create the privilege or was the privilege there and worth the sacrifice? I see that this is a new thought to many of you, but do not be afraid of it. It is all right. People look at it carefully. Please look at it carefully and think. That is all that is needed. I will say it over, even two or three times, if necessary, for it is fully worth it. Ever since that blessed fact came to me that the sacrifice of the Son of God is an eternal sacrifice and all for me, the word has been upon my mind almost hourly. I will go softly before the Lord all my days. The question is, did he create the privilege by making the sacrifice? Or was the privilege there already and we had lost it? And it was worth the sacrifice that he made to bring it to us again. Then who can estimate the privilege that God gives us in the blessed privilege of glorifying him? No mind can comprehend it. To be worth the sacrifice that was paid for it, an eternal sacrifice, Oh, did not David do well when he said, looking at these things, Oh, Lord, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. And in the multitude of my thoughts within me, 
that comforts delight my soul. Great is the mystery of godliness. For God was manifested, manifest in the flesh. The Son of Man received up into glory, that means ourselves, and in that he brought to us the infinite privilege of glorifying God. That was worth the price that he paid. We never could have dreamed that the privilege was so great, but God looked upon the privilege. Jesus Christ looked upon the privilege of what it is to glorify God. And looking upon that and seeing where we had gone, it was said, it was worth the price. Christ said, I will give the price. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and thus brought to us the privilege of glorifying God. So I hope you're blessed by the reading of this um, and the study that we've had today. So let's close in prayer. The dear Father in heaven, we know there is nothing in us that recommends us to you other than our need and our lack. We ask, Lord, that you can use us to your glory. And I pray for my friend Norman. I know that he um, is seeking you, and I do not bring these things as a criticism of him. But I know, Lord, that there is something lacking, because we all have something lacking. And we need you. We need to be able to see the truths in your word. I pray, Lord, that um, the Holy Spirit will be with us throughout this Sabbath, and that we can um, behold your glory. Give us a good rest tonight, and I pray for um, Dwight's presentation tomorrow, and that you can inspire his mind as he presents, and help us to have the same Holy Spirit inspire our hearts to receive the truths that you are giving to us. Continue to be with us and bring us together again, according to thy will, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.